The year is 1967. Soviet cosmonauts Vladimir Kamarov and Yuri Gagarin exit the LK lander and become the first humans to walk on the surface of the moon. People across the vast USSR and their allies abroad watch in awe and cheer in celebration at this achievement, while Washington fumes and NASA is called to Congress. This never happened, of course, but mankind was much closer to this scenario than you might imagine, and the Red Moon was almost a reality. Join me today on a journey through the stars as we take a look at how Soviet ambitions to be the first on the moon almost destroyed the entire Soviet space program. In the 1960s, there was an initiative for a joint US and Soviet program to put a man on the moon. But with the death of JFK and changes in Soviet leadership, this idea was abandoned. Instead, a competition began. The Soviets made it their top priority to put a man on the moon first, afraid of the awakening of NASA and their potential. The legendary engineer Sergei Karolyov was put in charge of this project and made a proclamation. The year 1967 was to be remembered as a new milestone in Soviet history to put the first man on the moon. But fate had other plans. Our focus today will be the LK lander, or translated from Russian, the lunar craft. The entire rocket which was to put the Soviets on the moon consisted of the following. A three-stage N1 super heavy booster rocket, the Soyuz L1 Lock, a modified Soyuz spacecraft, not to be confused with the Soyuz carrier rocket, and the LK lander. The story behind the N1 is a topic for another video, but the important thing to remember here is that the payload capacity for LEO, or low Earth orbit, was around 50 tons less than the Saturn V, standing at around 95 tons. Because of this significantly decreased payload capacity, this rocket required some serious weight management of everything on board for every aspect of the mission. Coincidentally, Karolyov chose the same strategy as the Apollo mission to get to the moon, called the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous. The main spacecraft and lander would enter the moon's orbit, then separate as the lander descended down to the lunar surface while the spacecraft remained in orbit till the mission was completed. The crew on board the lander would then launch back into orbit, dock on the spacecraft, and return home. All in one piece, hopefully. This actual mission path was first proposed by a very interesting figure, Yuri Kuntratyuk, all the way back in 1919. So perhaps it was less the Russians and rather NASA who was on the back foot at this stage of the race. The spacecraft meant to carry the cosmonauts to the moon would be called the LOC. The modified Soyuz, which would carry the lander, would have an additional stage, or Block G, as the Soviets called it, which would take the craft into the moon's orbit, and Block D, which would take the LK to the surface. Now that we have everything sorted out, let's look into the landing process and see how it differed from the Apollo's lunar module. After entering the moon's orbit, the astronaut would do a spacewalk from the lock to the LK lander, and this is the first major point of difference between the Soviet and NASA missions, because the American astronauts wouldn't need to leave the craft. You can imagine that logically this was a nightmare in hindsight and would be a logistical issue for transporting supplies between the two separate craft. After separation, Block D would take the lander down to the surface, and it would also be used to slow down the LK lander before touchdown. Because of limited space and payload capacity for the return journey, not much research could be done on the moon's surface. The astronauts would arrive, collect some samples, place the Soviet flag on the moon, that's a must, take some pictures, and return to the LK. Unlike the American Lunar Module, or LM for short, the LK docking procedure to the Soyuz lock was much simpler and purely mechanical. This was, again, meant to lower the weight and make everything as simple as possible. 
the astronauts needed to manually align probes into a hexagonal grid on the docking platform. Once docking was complete, they again had to spacewalk back to the lock with the samples taken from the surface. If you thought the initial boarding sounded difficult, imagine carrying moon rocks back on a spacewalk. After returning to the comparatively roomy LK, they would release any unnecessary equipment and the Soyuz craft would bring the astronauts back home. Simple, right? Well, surprisingly, yes. The LK and LOK were actually both successful pieces of the Soviet moon program. It was the booster that was plagued with issues. In 1966, Sergei Karlyov, leader of the mission, suddenly died, shocking the whole Soviet space community. The following year, in 1967, the main astronaut for the mission, Vladimir Kamarov, was killed in a Soyuz accident where his capsule was destroyed on the return to the ground from a mission. Yuri Gagarin, another planned crew member, was then removed from the project because he was a close friend of Kamarov and he was furious about the whole incident. Just a year later, he also died in a training accident. The first and the second N1 launches failed with the second exploding and destroying the entire launch pad, delaying the next launch for two years. And then, just 13 days later, Neil Armstrong made history with his famous small step for man, being the first to touch the surface of the moon. The whole Soviet expedition to the moon had lost its leadership and all common sense with it. They weren't going to be first anymore, and they lost some good men. Unfazed, they still pushed forward, but it seems the curse had not yet lifted. Two more launches happened in 1971 and 1972. Both resulted in failures, putting a nail in the coffin of Soviet lunar dreams. Met with failure at every turn, the Soviets pushed in another direction, to create space stations. Fortunately, this turned out to be the right decision. They went on to achieve many successes and pioneered many designs that are still heavily relied upon today. And remember that idea of a joint US-Soviet mission? Well, it actually happened with the Apollo-Soyuz missions and further down the line with the International Space Station. If only Karolyov, Gagarin, and Kamarov had lived to see all of it, perhaps they could have had another first in their amazing careers. But Looking back in history, it seems that it was only bad luck to blame for the end of the Soviet moon race. Thank you all so much for watching. Do let me know if you'd like to see a separate video on the Soyuz lock and the lunar module, and I'll be sure to release a video about the N1 and Saturn V sometime soon.